Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're a couple minutes late getting started, and uh, but uh, my name is Holly Mercer uh, from the University of Tennessee, and I'll be the session chair for uh, open source software and frameworks. Um, our first session is uh, it's a little bit different. It's a panel, and uh, we have uh, Tom Kramer. And Tom is one of the founding members of the Hydra Project, <laughs> uh, the first adopter of black light outside of Virginia and one of the social architects behind the International Image Interoperability Framework, IIIF. Now I won't have to say that again uh, later in the session. Uh, and Tom is the chief technology strategist and associate director of digital library systems and services at Stanford University Libraries. Uh, we also have John W. Dunn. Um, he is the Interim Assistant Dean for Library Technologies and Digital Libraries and Director of Library Technologies and Digital Libraries <laughs> at Indiana University. Uh, and um, he's co-director of the Variations on Video Project, a partnership between Indiana University and Northwestern University that is developing an open source software system to enable academic libraries and archives to easily provide online access to audio and video collections supported in part by the US Institute of Museum and Library Services. And the third panelist is Valerie Hollister, Director of Community Programs at DuraSpace. And Valerie leads the overall community strategy for the organization, ensuring that the priorities, projects, and development efforts are targeted targeting the greatest need in the community. Um, and jo Jonathan Marco is Chief Strategy Officer of DuraSpace, and he is moderating this first session. Thanks, Holly. Um, so have you, as you've heard, our panelists today have had a variety of experiences coordinating and leading collaborative uh, projects and initiatives in uh, the open source world. What we've decided to do as a format is to ask each of them to do a, a, ver a very brief introduction to the types of work that they've done, uh, collaborative work that they've done. And following that, we'll uh, open the floor to questions that you might have about uh, you know, what makes collaborations work, what presents challenges, or whatever you have in mind. So I think we'll begin with Tom. Uh, hi, I'm Tom Kramer from Stanford. Should I use a mic? Oh, yeah. Uh, and, no. Here. Yeah. Oh, I think this one might be on, too. This is good. Hello? Okay, good. Uh, and I'm going to talk about three different uh, open source collaborations that Stanford is involved in. Uh, the first one is Blacklight. Um, this is vanilla Blacklight and th the way it's been adopted at Stanford, at uh, WGBH, um, University of Wisconsin, uh, the Rock and, Roll, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, the library and archives there, uh, and then quite recently by the New York Public Library as a um, exhibit tool. Uh, it's a faceted search application. Uh, it's Ruby on Rails on top of Solar. A lot of you have seen that before. Many of you have developed it um, and, and deployed it here. It was originally started in University of Virginia around 2007. And in 2009, Stanford was the first institution outside of UVA to pick it up. And since then, it's grown to be, uh, there are scores of known implementations. Um, there are about uh, 10 committers from six different institutions that are, are participating in it. Uh, and it's really a developer-driven kind of grassroots project. Uh, Hydra is another uh, project. We've got awesome t-shirts. Um, you can uh, use it for institutional repositories, which have been done at a number of institutions, uh, images, archives, and special collections, uh, exhibits, and electronic theses and dissertations, among other things. It is uh, it's a application framework that complements Fedora. It's uh, useful for building um, what we call Hydra heads that sit on top. It started in 2008 with uh, three original institutions, Hull, Stanford, and Virginia, with Fedora Commons providing, at the time, providing kind of the social glue and the meeting spot. Um, it's institutionally driven and it's developer-led, uh, so it's, it's a little bit different than Blacklight, and maybe we'll talk about that more during the panel session. 
There are about a dozen active participating institutions at this point. Uh, there's 26 code contributors, and you can find out more at projecthydra.org. Uh, and the last item is uh, IIIF, or as we call it, double IIF, um, <laughs> is the International Image Interoperability Framework. If you stay until lunchtime or noon, you'll actually get 30 minutes on this because I'll be doing a longer presentation then. Um, this is an initiative of uh, a, a number of major research libraries and national libraries, or as I like to say, it's six of the world's greatest libraries in Stanford, um, are working together to uh, cooperatively define standard image access APIs in order to foster the development of a number of open source or commercial uh, image delivery applications. Um, it's uh, had modest but instrumental funding from the Mellon Foundation to get it off the ground. And it is actually different than the other two that it is not a technology development project. It's really a standards and content exposure uh, uh, operation. And you can find out more at lib.stamp.edu or by staying for another hour. John. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one more. Um, so just looking over what are some of the lessons that, that we have learned, um, I'm assured that my colleagues have similar slides in their deck. So just to prime the pump, uh, some of the things that we've found that do work in terms of setting up collaborations is when everyone has a common vision uh, that, is kind of, that is instrumental. Uh, it's important to be productive so people feel like they're actually getting something out of the collaboration. But it's also important to be welcoming and fun. If you're productive without being welcoming and fun, you're not going to get people to join. Engineering FaceTime is absolutely essential in, in our experience. And one key is the network effect, is start off with great contributors. If you get great contributors, people want to work with those people, and they tend to get more great contributors. Um, the things that some of the stumbling blocks that we have encountered is when you try to overplan or try to overmanage, uh, that tends to grind things to a halt. Um, if you establish too many cross-institution dependencies, uh, that also tends to grind things to a halt. You cannot run a cross-institutional project as if it were an intra-institutional project. Um, and don't get hooked on grant funding. The first one's free, but then it'll cost you. <laughs> so, John. Hi, John. Pass the button. Yeah. All right, thanks, Tom. Well, I think, uh, I think we'll find ourselves echoing some of these uh, lessons uh, um, across our, our various projects. But I'm uh, uh, going to talk <laughs> about collaboration in the context of two particular projects, uh, and I'll, I'll describe those briefly. One is a project uh, known as Sakaibrary. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Sakai uh, collaboration and learning environment or uh, course management system or e-learning environment, uh, whatever you want to call it. But it's uh, an open source um, uh, system that's uh, in use by, at this point, hundreds of different institutions as their uh, e-learning or, or course management uh, environment. Uh, and there are dozens of institutions contributing to its development. Um, the project I was involved in leading was an effort uh, that was a joint project between Indiana University and the University of Michigan Libraries uh, to uh, develop extensions to Sakai to enable um, better use of library resources uh, within the teaching and learning process within this uh, existing uh, developing tool. And so um, uh, we uh, began as a, a kind of a top-down initiative, a uh, bunch of uh, library uh, deans and directors getting together and saying, you know, we really should be part of this Sakai thing. Why, why haven't we gotten any money from the Mellon Foundation to, 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 to be a part of this? And, and uh, uh, it then led to, um, uh, as I said, a project between uh, IU and Michigan to develop some uh, tools to basically work with library meta search engines, uh, uh, which was, you know, the cool new technology at the time. Uh, to, to make it easier for faculty to uh, find resources, construct reading lists, and, and make those available through Sakai. Um, the other project, which is a current project, uh, is called Variations on Video, uh, as Holly mentioned. And this is a collaboration between Indiana and Northwestern University Libraries. So you see each of these, both of these projects are primarily collaborations between two lead institutions and then a larger set of institutions who provided input in, and feedback on requirements and uh, functionality uh, uh, and uh, evaluate and provide feedback on the software that was developed. Uh, this is a, a Hydra and Fedora based system to provide access to audio and video collections. Uh, one of the interesting things is that we are developing this as, as using a kind of a single distributed development team across two institutions using an agile scrum uh, approach. 
Uh, and this really began not as a top-down sort of initiative, but uh, bottom-up from people within, uh, within uh, IU and Northwestern who had a need to uh, provide better access to audio and video collections and, and uh, wanted to develop software to do it. So just quickly, some of the lessons learned across these, these two projects. Uh, one is in, in terms of success factors, both, both of these, it was very valuable to have an initial period in which we were not actually trying to develop software, but, but trying to better define what it is that we wanted to do and establish what our, our shared, shared values and vision were. Um, and I think that, that helped very much. Uh, uh, another uh, important thing, I think, is to have good relationships between uh, project directors or leaders at the institutions uh, participating in the project and have regular communications uh, at that level to try to resolve cross-institutional problems uh, quickly. You know, I mentioned the collaborative development model. Uh, some of the challenges uh, we faced have to do with divergent timelines across institutions. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to kind of sync up uh, shared timelines and vision. Um, Echo Tom, you know, face-to-face -face meetings, very, very important to, I think, maintain a healthy cross-institutional project team. Um, we had some, some challenges that I can talk more about perhaps later uh, in terms of trying to integrate into an existing community culture in the case of Sakai, which had a very much a culture of its own. Uh, and then uh, challenges with sustainability and shifts, dealing with shifts in institutional priorities. Not all of the institutions that come into a project at the start may share an interest in that project a few years down the road, and you can't necessarily count on current commitments uh, being future commitments. So, turn it over to Holly, I mean to Val. Oh, Val? That's the one, yeah. Hi, I'm Mallory Hollister. I'm the Director of Community Programs for the DuraSpace organization, and um, as many of you know, DuraSpace is the organization, the not-for-profit organization, that gives guidance and leadership to the DSpace and Fedora software projects. And part of my role is to encourage groups within uh, the DSpace community to uh, collaborate and build consensus on various projects and try and gain some momentum. So um, I'm going to talk about a little bit different uh, collaboration. It's actually a collaboration within the DSpace community um, and something that um, that we had a, a variety of people um, in the community interested in getting more voices in the development process um, for the DSpace software. Um, all of what I'm going to mention today is very much a work in process, and in fact, we had the um, DSpace developer meeting um, on Monday and, and have made some additional tweaks and continue to make some additional tweaks to um, the, the uh, collaboration. So, um, let's see. The, um, Collaboration um, that I want to talk about is the uh, DSpace community advisory team collaborating with the DSpace developers, those people that are the most involved with DSpace development. Um, and as most of you know, DSpace is an open source technology, meaning it's developed by a bunch of volunteers who, um, whose time is pretty much dictated by the priorities of their uni university or institution, or you know, by however constrained their, hour, their free hours are. Um, so there's, there is a limit to developer time, um, and, and, and of course the priorities are primarily dictated by the institutions they work for. So DK, DCAT was formed, um, DSpace Community Advisory Team, to try and inject some other voices in the process, recognizing that not only um, do other voices, should other voices potentially be involved, but also that the DSpace developers might need some help in accomplishing releases or fleshing out feature requirements. So um, it was um, sort of a mutually, uh, a mutually agreeable solution to come up with this group and to have this group have some interaction and role in reviewing specifically new feature requests for the DSpace platform. Um, the group was formed in uh, January 2011 and its specific goals was to help with new feature requests to validate broader community um, uh, uh, needs for the software, to gauge the level, le the relative level of importance um, from one uh, feature request over another, and to also um, allow for lots of discussion within the community beyond just the DCAT group or the developers. So some of the successes um, that DCAT specifically has had is they've reviewed, um, discussed, gathered feedback for over 15 different new feature requests, three of which have made it into the last major DSpace release 
um, as a part of this DCAT develop DSpace developer collaboration. Um, another huge benefit it, it is it has accomplished accomplished the goal and actually extending and broadening the conversation about DSpace development um, to to um, actually occur with people occur with people outside the developer group specifically. So um, and also the developers themselves have um, gotten some very useful and timely feedback. Um, in order to validate their implement implementation plans on specific feature requests. So the group's been able to, to um, help the developers in, in some pretty quick turnarounds. Also, there were some, um, a, a community survey that the DCAT performed, analyzed that, and made some recommendations based on what the community was telling, um, telling us through that survey. Some of the challenges um, basically, what are the sticking points? What could be improved? Um, basically, there are no guarantees that just because something seems important that uh, the feature is going to make it in, even if everyone wants it to. Um, everyone, meaning the community, DCAT, the developers, um, it does seem to be um, still that we are challenged to find resources to accomplish everything. and. It's clear that we need to continue to broaden the discussion amongst more members of the community so that we can identify shared interest in new features and potentially little pockets of resource or time and, and have that sort of um, come to light more quickly so we can actually get more of these new features in. Um, DCAT could also be uh, more helpful during the re release process itself. And this is something we spoke about in the developer meeting on Monday, that um, DCAT could be more engaged in helping to um, do some of the testing uh, before a release is, is done, and also um, you know, rooting out some of the bugs before, before the release is, is cut. So overall, the DCAT collaboration has been successful um, not only in creating more discussion, but also adding a, new, a few new features so far. Um, again, it's very much a work in process and we're continuing to make improvements on how we communicate um, with each other and with the rest of the community and how we can get more and more of the community involved, so. Okay. Thanks, panelists. I think that I'll start us off with a question and I'll ask the panelists to uh, keep their remarks brief so that we have time for some audience questions as well. Um, I think one of the <coughs> critical success factors for doing these types of collaborations are having, uh, is having effective governance of the collaboration of the group. And that could be formal or it could be informal. But I'd be curious to hear um, what your experience has been with regard to you know, how has leadership emerged or been imposed on your collaboration and how has decision making uh, how does decision making take place? Tom? Uh, well, I, th I think it's different in the different cases and the uh, difference between a bottom-up community and a top-down one is, is probably a salient point. Um, in the bottom-up uh, efforts that I'm familiar with, so Blacklight and, and part of Hydra, it's really the developers, there's a group of developers who have really come to work with each other, trust each other, and work effectively with each other. Uh, we spent a lot of time on, as Blacklight was ramping up, trying to figure out how to expand the contributor base while also maintaining the code quality. Um, and that was, for a culture that's conflict averse, um, that was a challenge because we had people who weren't, anything that goes into Blacklight needs to have test coverage uh, and should be reviewed by more than just the developer. Um, that was, not, people weren't used to doing that in their local institutions and people at institutions who were practicing it weren't necessarily had the skills or the comfort level to say, uh, what you've done is great, but it needs to go up just this level more. Uh, I think the, the governance model has been a, a bit different in the two projects I talked about. In the first, Sakibrary, um, uh, well, in both cases, the thing that's similar is there was a grant proposal that was guiding the, the project, that was kind of a, a project charter, if you will, that kind of defined what the deliverables were. So there's some things that it would be difficult to kind of argue about or disagree about. But in the case of Sakibrary, we tried to take, I think, a more consensus approach to, to governance, uh, which, um, while good in some respects, I think led us to be a bit less productive in the project than mm -hmm. we might otherwise have been uh, within 
the variations on video project, at least in terms of the, the software that's being developed and the features that are going into that and the prioritization of those features, we're really using the Scrum method to help drive that uh, in, in terms of having strong uh, product owner uh, role within, if you're familiar with, with Scrum or other Agile <coughs> methods, a, a product owner, product owners are really ultimately res responsible for the, um, the, the features and functionality and prioritization of those in, in, in the development process. And um, while we try to involve the whole team in, in those discussions, ultimately, you know, the team understands it's up to the product owner to, to define those priorities. Now, when we expand into other institutions, with, which we hope to, with other maybe different interests uh, in where they want to take the, the product and uh, probably can't have as much of a single development team. I think we're going to have to explore other uh, other ways of doing that and, and learn from some of the things that Hydra and other projects have done. So I think it's a little different with the DCAT and um, DSpace developer um, collaboration. Um, there is certainly an agreement um, and consensus building that occurred um, initially with the developers between the developers and DCAT, and then um, you know some sort of some ongoing communications of, of natural, <coughs> very intuitive leaders. So the release coordinator for 1.8 was someone who is uh, fairly engaged and, and taking sort of a, a lead in representing the committers um, when DCAT got together for its calls, and then. Um, in terms of just the work, each uh, DCAT member took the lead on a specific um, request, a new feature request, and conducting, you know, um, sort of an analysis and a review of what was available, as well as, you know, going out um, to the developers or whomever was associated with the request and trying to get more information, and then end up um, facilitating more communication, more um, discussion. Thanks. Um. <coughs> So I think we'll take, we'll see if anyone has a question out there. Um, do we have time? Yeah, I can maybe pass your mic. Oh, OK. So how are we going to do that? Right. So someone's going to have to scream. Either you'll have to scream or they'll have to scream. No, no, she can pass. Oh, we can pass this one around? OK. OK. <laughs> so there's someone with a question. Nope. All right. Um, so, I'm going to start over from the back. So, in a team development effort, what I've noticed is there is there is great value in being able to just uh, talk to your teammates, just walk in somebody's office and ask them a question. Yeah, I don't know this. Can you help me with that? Mm -hmm. And also, there's a lot of decisions just kind of made for free. You just you just talk the problem through, and you're done five minutes later. But when it's uh, development across geographic boundaries, you can spend like an hour on a conference call um, mm -hmm. trying to get a decision for the most trivial things. So how do you how do you get past that? How do you when you have people who are not physically there? How do you come to an agreement? How do you how do you do these things? Mm -hmm. And we'll just ask anyone who wants to respond um, to do so. You don't have to, but we'd like to take it. In the in the case of the the variations on video project, uh, you know between Indiana and Northwestern, um, I think we take a couple of different approaches to that. One is that we're using an IRC channel and also uh, Microsoft for, for kind of group communication. Also Microsoft Link for one to one communication, so people will will feel free to just use that to contact you know a team member at the other institution on the spot uh, who's available to 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 kind of talk over a, a, a question right there. Uh, we also have uh, daily stand-up meetings, you know, 15-minute meetings every morning uh, via telephone or video conference uh, for issues that, you know, maybe need to be addressed the, the, you know, within the next day. And then the fact that we're using an agile approach with kind of two-week development cycles means that it's not necessarily cost, you know, it's not hugely costly sometimes to go back and, and change something or do something a different way if, if we um, maybe didn't find out later that we, we took the wrong approach, you know, once more information comes in. So uh, we do a lot of the similar. Uh, so we actually have erred too much at previous times on relying on conference calls. And what we found, if it's taking an hour to decide something trivial, it's probably the wrong question. And it probably doesn't need to be decided. Um, 
there's a lot of use, uh, there's a shift towards IRC and away from email lists, which is a problem for some people when working across multiple time zones, because uh, that, that can be a challenge. Um, but it also, I think the, the distribution can often let people formulate their thoughts a little bit more, so it imposes a little bit more rigor, so they actually have to compose their thoughts, make a proposal, and carry it forward, and that discipline isn't bad. There's one contributor in the Blacklight community who is um, uh, quite loquacious and uh, writes emails and sends them, uh, and then later will often res respond to himself, and he'll have a thread with himself three times and come to a resolution just by himself on list. And uh, one of the community processes has evolved as people realize, just wait 10 minutes and you probably, it'll be resolved. Um, so it's, I think people begin to learn mechanisms for working with each other and it kind of smooths the process. Alex, did you want to add? I, I, I wanted to add that um, within the Dura Space organization, we're um, really a virtual organization and we're located all over the place and we live in Skype. It's like our conference room, you know. So we have it on all day and we're constantly communicating. And sometimes there are lengthy um, discussions among developers in, in chat rooms and sometimes there are planned meetings and a lot of communication hap happens that way. I do miss though the uh, water cooler effect of, you know, just sort of showing up and having an informal kind of, um, you know, chat and sharing the kind of, you know, tacit understandings that people develop in those kinds of close, closer relationships. I think there's no good substitute for that. Um, do we have time for another question? One more question. No? Okay, great. Good morning. Thank our speakers. Thank you.